Day four is upon us, everybody. Welcome to Clean Water Fest Day four. Today is the day we've all been waiting for all week. It is Clean Water Kids Day. So much to set. We had a whole thing planned. We had a whole thing planned where there would be emojis flying at me and they all land below chest level. But see, that's just, that's not even fun anymore. I mean, they were all supposed to be up here. We, we should have practiced that. All right, so we didn't practice. But what we do have is a great day for you. We have a great uh, broadcast coming at you live from our Clean Water Fest studios here at our Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District headquarters. Uh, welcome back. My name is John Gonzalez, John G at N-E-O-R-S-D. We hope you've been tuning in to cleanwaterfest.com. We hope this isn't the first time you've joined us, but if it is, there's a lot we have in store. Anything you've missed from the last several days are all available on our website, cleanwaterfest.com. You can catch, uh, catch up on our past broadcasts. Uh, days one, two, and three are all archived there now and readily available for you to go back and enjoy. Uh, why binge Netflix when you can binge cleanwaterfest.com for the first time uh, ever? It would be a great experience if you haven't seen it yet. If you have, we're glad you're back for day four. So as I said, which was intended to be more of a flourish, was going to be Clean Water Kids Day. And we're going to have several special guests with us today. Looking forward to that very much. Uh, if you have seen us in past days, you saw us take a tour of the lab. And the lab is a fun place. Uh, it's a very serious place. But you, you may also be surprised to find out that there's a lot of fun that goes on there as well. So anytime you're in a lab, you have to make sure you have the proper gear. And I'm fortunate enough to have a lab coat of my own. I think they know I have this. I may have to make sure that they know that I'm wearing it, not in an official capacity, but in an outreach capacity. So I've got my lab coat on. I have my, my glasses on for, for eye protection. And we're going to go in deep into our lab uh, for our Fab Lab duo. This year, we are starring Adam Beaker, who you are maybe familiar with from uh, last year. And his new sidekick this year is Pete Reedish. We have a great feature for them to kick off today's broadcast. And following that, we'll have an interview with both Pete and Adam about some of the work they're doing and what science means for our organization and what it means to you who are watching this at home. So stay tuned. We're looking forward to getting this day started and uh, enjoy our feature presentation for today. Adam Beaker and Pete Reedish, take it away. It's your old friend, Adam Beaker. Today, here I'm at the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District lab. I'm here to visit my friend, Petri Dish, and we're gonna do some fun science experiments. So, let's roll. I got some permanganate here. Uh, we use this at the water treatment plants to like do really cool stuff. It's a really awesome oxidizer. It's actually a redox reaction where one chemical compound loses some electrons and another one gains some. And in that process, new compounds are formed. And the cool thing is we can actually see all the steps of when it's losing these electrons because it does it two times actually. Two times? And each time it will have a different color. Let's do this. Okay, it's purple. 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 Now it's blue. It's blue. Now it's green. Now, I said it was going to do it twice, right? Uh-huh. So it's green now. Okay. But for this one, you need to be a little more patient. It's turning from manganate to manganese dioxide now. Okay. And manganese dioxide is a solid and it's like brownish. Mm -hmm. But because the solid particles are so small, they'll actually make the water look yellowish. Okay, yeah, I can start to see it now. Yeah. I have a question for you. Shoot. You see those two beakers here? Yes. What if I were to say that I could move the water from this beaker okay. all the way to this beaker, but here's the catch. Without moving this beaker towards the other beaker, it's going to stay right here. 
Well, Pete, I would call you a liar because that's impossible. Actually, it's not, Adam. Have you ever heard of adhesion and cohesion? Maybe, but why don't you explain it? I got some water here. Okay. I'm gonna put some drops here. Now you tell me, is this completely flat, spread out over the bench everywhere, or? Mm. No. Do you see the little? See, kind of curve. Little bump? Yeah, 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 yeah. So what we're looking at here yeah. is cohesion. Cohesion. This is the water and the molecules inside sticking together. So is that like when I jump out of a pool, I still have water on me because it's sticking together? Mm, no, but you bring up a good point there, Adam. Okay. What you're describing is the other phenomena. It is adhesion. Adhesion. It's not sticking to itself, but it's sticking to you. So that's another thing water is good at. Now, remember I challenged you, right? And you called me, you even called me a liar. Yeah, because why would that work? Does this little explanation, did it change your mind? Well, yeah, I guess so, but I think the only way for me to really fully understand is if we actually maybe have a competition, because I feel like you're challenging me, challenging me. A competition? Yeah, so mm. maybe the first one to get their water and the other one wins. I accept the challenge. <laughs> Three, two, two, one, go. go. Start pouring. Holy crap, it's working. Look at that. Adhesion and cohesion at work, my friends. One would think it would fall off the yarn, but mm -hmm. it doesn't. Through the force of adhesion, mm -hmm. water sticks to the yarn. Through the force of cohesion, mm -hmm. any extra water we add mm -hmm. sticks to itself and can travel along the yarn all the way across the beaker. Look at that. My cup is filling up. So Pete, how, how would this kind of relate to anything that we do here at the district? Well, our main product that we treat here mm -hmm. is... Water. It's water, exactly. So the properties that we saw that water has mm -hmm. come in very handy at the water treatment plant. Got it, okay. They can use this when they're designing their plants and make sure the water goes wherever they want it to go. So Adam, it's time for our grand finale of our afternoon of experiments. Wait, how do we get outside? Adam, that doesn't matter, focus. Okay, I'll focus, The focus. grand finale The grand finale, okay. What's that? It's the famous elephant toothpaste. Oh, okay, I've heard of this. Here oh. we go. Are you ready? Yeah, go. Whoa. Whoa. And hoplo. Not every lab has mad scientists, and so we are very happy to have both Adam and uh, Pete in our lab. Uh, those are, uh, I don't know if those are their real names or not. I haven't seen their ID badges that uh, are required to get into our laboratory, but I'm going to bring them on now because we do have, the mute button is an interesting thing. We've got a, a great interview with Pete and Adam coming up with you live here, and I'm going to bring them on to join us for that conversation and uh, tell you a little bit more about what's going on in the lab and how science is part of our, our everyday work here at the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. And Adam and Pete are just joining us now. And uh, Patrick, I believe you are Adam Baker. And so we'll uh, bring both of you on here momentarily and get your uh, cameras up and running. Glad to have you. Patrick is here. He is the one and only Adam Baker. And Pete Reedish is coming on scene now. And you can tell which is the real scientist and which is the one who is, is helping to get the science into the hands of you, the viewer, and helping you see what's going on here. So Patrick and Pete, Yeroon uh, is Pete Reedish, Yeroon, and he works in our laboratory. Adam Beaker, who is uh, also known as Patrick Gibbony, and he works in our human resources department. And this duo here is here to tell you a lot about what we're doing in the lab and also what we're doing across the organization uh, to be able to, to bring this science into the hands of, of kids, of adults, to get to know more about the work we do. 
Uh, Pete, let me start with you. First of all, is, is the bow tie part of your your uh, your PPE? Is it officially offered by the district, or is that is that yours personally? It is not, not yet. I okay. uh, might work on a petition to add that to it, though. I would sign that, and uh, we may be able to to know somebody in human resources to move that along. So, looking forward to that. Uh, I want to talk about obviously science is our focus today, and want to talk about your background, Pete uh, Yarun, as your as your real name is. Tell me a bit about uh, where you came from. Where's your Where's your science background? I'm from Belgium, so I studied in Belgium. I started off with a bachelor in chemistry, and and I did that because I was very interested in biotechnology, anything that has to do with genetics. So I was studying chemistry to get there, but along the way, I realized there was something as environmental sciences, and it was all based on my bachelor in chemistry. So I took a side road to environmental sciences and started studying chemistry, specialized in soil treatment, water treatment, air treatment, any kind of environmental pollutants. So that's what got me into the environmental sciences. And I'm glad you told that story because as we learned just a couple of days ago, as we heard from uh, Cheryl in our lab, if you missed uh, day two, you can go back and check out day two's broadcast. Cheryl Soltis-Muth talked about the variety of sciences that are represented in our lab. And several of the ones Pete just mentioned are also represented in our laboratory. Uh, Adam Beaker, also known as Patrick Gibney, you don't have a science background, but you've got a, a background mm -hmm. in human resources and relationships. relationships. Tell us a bit about what you focus on and the work you're doing. Yeah, so um, as a science enthusiast, I, uh, I help out um, our talent acquisition team. I hire a lot of our interns that work um, here at the district. They do fantastic work. Um, and yeah, just being part of the team and being part of the organization, you know, as a science enthusiast brings me a lot of joy every day. Now, it, it, I believe science enthusiast is a new job title that we're working on. So do you have your, new, That's you true. Have your business cards made up yet? That's true. Yes. I also found out I have a corner office now because of my new title. Wow. That, that's impressive. I, so let me, let me move from the enthusiast uh, to, mm -hmm. the, to the person here who does have the science background. So coming back to you, Pete, uh, what do you love most about science? Why is this your area of, of passion? John, uh, science, it's just everywhere. You see it when you wake up. When you see when you go to sleep, you might not realize it, but it's everywhere. It's everything. You know that little thing we have, uh, all of us now, with a touch screen? There you go. Look, everybody. That would not be able to exist without science. There's awesome scientists that are doing all bunch of stuff. And one of them is inventing a touch screen and you might not see, but if you zoom into anything, you can start wondering what science is behind this. Is, is it a material? Is it maybe an animal you see? It's all science. So it's just everywhere. And that's what's so fascinating about it. So like Adam says, there's a lot to be excited about and certainly a lot to be enthusiastic about. I love to see the energy. I love it. Uh, watching that feature video. You can also find that on cleanwaterfest.com if you want to pull that out and share that with friends. That video really conveys a sense of excitement that you have for the job. I'm guessing those types of experiments aren't happening around you in the lab every day. How do you keep your job exciting and how does it, how does it keep you motivated to get the job done every day? Well, the thing we're working on here, all of us at the district is water. At the district specifically, we're making sure the water goes back to Lake Erie in a decent, clean state. And water, it's the gold of the future, John. It's just so important to us. I mean, I'm sure all the kids watching now love swimming in the summer. They get thirsty also, and they want to drink. And that's the other part, drinking water. It's taking even a step further. So that alone, knowing that we exist of 75% water that we need it every day to bathe, to drink for leisure. It's just so amazing that we're making all of that possible. And so Patrick, coming back to you and the work you do, what, what keeps mm -hmm. you motivated every day? What, what helps you focus on and keep you enthusiastic uh, on the work that we do to, to keep our great lake great? Yeah. So when I, I have an interesting perspective where I get to bring in the people that do um, the daily things that we do every single day, all, every single um, or 365, 24 seven operation. So I get to find those people that want to contribute to something bigger to the, uh, bigger than themselves. 
and also like have a sense of community pride and giving back um, and finding that right person to bring in here. I, I just, I love meeting new people and it, and it gets me so excited because when I go out into the community at recruiting events or visiting colleges, I, I feel like I'm a representative, not to the district, but also to the city of Cleveland. So, and, and Northeast Ohio. So I get to like show, you know, how cool, you know, the district is, but also how cool Northeast Ohio really is. Um, and then also, John, I forgot, I wanted to mention, those experiments that me and Pete did, I do those at my desk all the time. So, you know. Is, is that why we're always getting calls from our uh, from our, our cleanup team downstairs? To, there, well, always, yes, it is. There's always a lot of stuff going on. It, it, there's a, now it's, it's answering so many questions for me. Yeah, yeah. And so let me ask this. I want to come back to you, Pete. Who has been an inspiration to you in the past? Do you have inspirations that have led you to, I don't know if Adam's, I don't think Adam's the, the inspiration. But you have people who have inspired you to get into this area of science, or really, is it just science itself has really kept you uh, curious and kept you motivated to, to stay on the path you're on? Initially, it was science itself that I was so fascinated about. But now, as a scientific, scientific professional, I've worked with a lot of other scientists. And among them, Adam Beaker, of course, at the top of the list. But if, if I go look at a more scientific approach. I am thinking of the lab directors that I've been working with and further than that, the other people working in the lab, but I'm especially amazed every time by lab directors because they not only need to know everything about the science part of it, but there is a regulation part of it too where uh, the law comes into place. And on top, of all of, on top of all that, there is our community that we are tied into. So it is, a, it is amazing to see what they need to know to make sure everything that needs to be done is done in a way that is correct to ensure the safety of people, like I said, using the water for leisure or for drinking. And so as, as Pete's talking about, if you're watching this today, if you haven't seen our past broadcast leading up to uh, today's broadcast, I definitely encourage you to go back and check those out because they really do capture uh, the personalities, the skills, the talents, the passions that our team has. And we're happy to be able to tell that story with you and, and help you understand where our work is really affecting you all around your area, no matter where you live, no matter what you're doing, this type of work affects you. Uh, Adam, if we can come back to you, Patrick, do you have people who have inspired you to, to, to be enthusiastic about the work that you're doing? Yeah, first and foremost, it's uh, Wally Waldrop. He's my number one inspiration. I would think um, that, would, that, that makes sense. Yeah. So um, what was the question again? Sorry, I just, I'm, I get so excited thinking about Wally. I, I know you should, but the question is, do you have inspiration, the people that you look up to as you have come in, into the, the work that you're doing right now? Yeah, um, like really just the, everybody here at the district, um, you just get inspi inspired by just the little things they do every single day and just um, getting to see, you know, when we were able to see each other every single day, um, always gave me a sense of like, I I'm glad I'm here. Um, I'm, I'm glad I get to work with an awesome team. Um, there's some really amazing people that work here at the district that do um, amazing things every single day that don't really get recognized, um, but that's okay, you know, because we're kind of more behind the scenes utility, um, but making sure that we, what we do every single day um, helps the, the community run and move forward. And I think that's a big part of like uh, Northeast Ohio is, is moving forward. And I think we get to be a big part of that. Um, yeah. So let me ask you that follow up and then I'll, mm -hmm. then I'll move to Pete. So you, uh, in your, the work that you do, you mm -hmm. have a lot of conversation with high school students, college students who are trying to figure out what they want to do, what, where they yeah. want to go, what fields interest them, where they want to be able to spend their time and what they can call a career. What message do you have for them if they're a college student or a high school student who may be watching this as part of an assignment or just tuning in because they may have seen us on, on Twitter or Facebook? What message do you have for them? Yeah, um, so I would just say just remain curious when you're, when you're thinking about, you know, what you want to do in your career. Think about like, just what do you actually want to do? If it's, if it's helping some someone, then, you know, start testing out new things. Um, I think just being a curious person 
and that kind of goes with science. Science um, often, you know, as a science enthusiast, I'm uh, I'm often curious on uh, what what I can do. So remaining curious, always learning, you know, being a lifelong student, not a, just in school, but in life, just continue to, you know, try to improve and try to figure out what we're, you know, what we're all doing, yeah. you know, so without getting too philosophical, but yeah, what we're yeah. kind of all doing here. That was, that was a very deep response. And so I'm not, no, I'm, yeah, still, you know, I'm still processing, you know Adam is. I'm still processing that. So, but I, but I, I can respect the fact that there's, there's so much that can be learned and it, it's about going outside your comfort zone and looking to see where you can apply your talents, interests, skills. Uh, we are certainly a place where those opportunities lie, but it's about you advancing your own uh, interests, your own passion, exactly. kind of find out where you can spend your time and, and use it in a way that's productive. So Pete, let me ask you that question. If you were talking to high school students or maybe younger, maybe there's elementary school, middle school kids who are, are tuned into a science class here, what message do you have for them in the role that you have as a, as a mad scientist? I agree with Adam. Be curious. That was the first thing that popped into my mind. And to elaborate on that, any age, but especially when kids are super young, they're really good at asking questions. Why, why, why? I'm sure any parent with a five-year-old or younger even knows this, but that's a good thing. Be curious, be bold, ask questions and follow your passion. If you're, if you're interested in something, you might not be good at it yet, but if you're interested, you can do it. You will learn, you'll ask questions, you'll find out more and you'll get good at it. And if you are passionate, you'll get really good at it and you'll have, you'll have a really, really fun life that is fulfilling because you are curious, you wanna find out stuff and you'll get answers. Uh, be curious, be bold and ask questions. I think those are good, uh, good recommendations for anybody, whether you're looking for a career or just trying to go ahead and start your day. I would uh, support those in, in all aspects. Adam and Pete, I want to thank you for joining us. Let me follow up before we transition to our next segment for the, the, the day. We've got uh, a couple different recipes for some of the experiments that were conducted here on video, plus a few others on our website, cleanwaterfest.com. So check that out. Don't miss it. Uh, can, Pete, I mean, can I keep this? I might need your authorization. Can I keep this jacket or do I have to turn it back to the supervisor? On one condition, if okay. you sign my petition to add the bow tie to the PPE lists. I, I, I'll, I'll come down and meet you. I will make sure that that happens today. I'll have my mask on and we'll sign that off. Adam, you were going to hey, say something? Hey, um, I, John, I believe that is my lab coat. I was looking all over. I had to grab my other one. I think that's my... Yeah, you know, the weird thing is, we're, I'm, you're, you're, Adam, I think your connection is you, bad. You, yeah. You forgot it in the lab. Oh, see, okay. I was going to say, I don't, I don't appreciate having uh, dispersions uh, cast in my direction. I think this was, this was rightfully mine. You know, as a science enthusiast, I was curious yeah. on where my lab coat, you know, ended up at. Well, it's, so, it's not surprising that the real scientist among us yes. is the one to figure out what the truth is and found oh it came to the heart goodness. of that. So oh. with that, with that, I'm going to transition now. I want to thank both Adam Beaker, who is our own Patrick uh, Gibbony, and Pete Reedish, who is our own Yaroon uh, Van Ecker. And so it's great to have you both here in character, in person, and we appreciate your time this afternoon. We look forward to, uh, to talking with you again. We are going to be uh, taking you to the next segment for today, and we are going to be making sure that everyone here has a chance to see a little bit more about what work goes on and how we go about the work, not only in science, but to make sure that you've got an opportunity to see where you fit in that water cycle. Uh, we shared some of this information earlier in the week. We look forward to bringing a few of our experts back. We're going to talk to Jessica and we're going to talk to Ebony and bring them back for a few minutes to talk a bit more about how we reach out to kids, what that outreach looks like in this today's environment, what it used to look like uh, before COVID, but how we're looking to move forward and stay connected with the people who, who need to learn about this work because our water work, our clean water work affects everybody every day. So we're going to move on and transition here momentarily. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with you momentarily. and we're the sewer crew. Did you know that the water that you see flowing from the sink or down the toilet is treated by the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District and returned back to the environment safely? That's what we do. 
This is our friend Molly Waterdrop. He's part of the urban water cycle that helps clean our water, making it safe for us to use every day. Over the next few minutes, we're gonna share some trivia, helpful tips to keep our water clean, and ways to help make a difference for years to come. It's easy, and we can all play a part in keeping our water clean. So, let's dive right in. Did you know one of Cleveland's oldest sewers was built in 1873 and is still in use today? Now you know. Tip number one. In the greater Cleveland area, we live and work in a watershed that flows to Lake Erie. In our daily lives, we use many products that contain chemicals that may be hazardous to the environment. Examples include cleaners, polishes, antifreeze, used motor oil, pesticides, batteries, paints, paint thinners, furniture strippers, mercury thermometers, and other products. The hazards increase when these products are improperly used or discarded. The toilet is not a trash can. Help us keep the environment safe for years to come by recycling and disposing of products in the proper way. Find out more ways at neorsd.org backslash healthy home. Did you know that dog droppings can impact our groundwater streams and lake? Now you know. Tip number two. It's true. Dogs play an important role in keeping our water clean too. When it rains, bacteria from doggy poo can soak into groundwater or be carried by rainwater to storm sewers, which carry the flow to nearby streams. In both cases, the water is not treated at a wastewater treatment plant and that's not good for the environment. So, take the pup pledge and pick up poop. Learn more at dogscantflush.org. Did you know the first flushing toilet was invented by Sir John Harrington in 1596? Sheesh, it's a long time ago. Tip number three, don't flush unused medication down the toilet. Flushing pills down the toilet can be a water quality issue because wastewater treatment plants are not equipped to remove pharmaceuticals from the wastewater. Those medications could affect the environment and endanger public health. So, what do you do if you have unused medication? Cuyahoga County Solid Waste District offers year-round recommendations, including the County Sheriff's Prescription Drug Drop Box Program at local law enforcement agencies. The district also hosts Pitch Those Pills, safe drop-off events for unused pharmaceuticals. Did you know that while the 1969 Cuyahoga River fire was famous, it wasn't the first time that it caught fire. It's actually burned at least 13 times. How crazy. Tip number four. Do you know what stormwater runoff is? Stormwater runoff contributes to regional stream flooding, erosion, and water quality issues. And the program improves our ability to further address stormwater problems. When property owners make changes or improvements on their properties to reduce the amount of runoff affecting local streams and storm sewers, they may be eligible for a fee credit or a reduction in what they are charged. Actions like disconnecting downspouts, installing rain barrels, or planting rain gardens are some of the ways property owners can better control runoff on their property. Parents can find more information by visiting neorsd.org backslash stormwater. Did you know there's a place to learn even more about the water treatment and history of sewers here in Northeast Ohio? Here's Jamie to tell you more. Tip number five. That's right. Join Sewer University through NEORSD to get an education right from home. You can graduate sewer cum laude. Check it out at neorsd.org backslash sewer you. So there you have it. A lot of information on Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District and the amazing programs this organization offers the communities it serves. For a chance to win some amazing prizes from the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, help us answer these questions. Email your response to events at neorsd.org. Five winners will be chosen at random from all eligible entries. Question number one. What is the name of the organization that works hard to keep our water clean? Number two. When was the first sewer invented in Cleveland? 
Number three, which great lake does our water come from? Number four, what does PUP Pledge stand for? Head over to learn more about the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District at NEORSD.org. And you can tweet with the at NEORSD. Thank you so much for joining us. Can't wait to see you soon. Thank you, Adam and Pete, for showing us the ways in which science is around us every day. What we've covered this week are ways in which the Clean Water Fest touches on the urban water cycle and uses that as the foundation for our messages. Just as science is around us every day, there's other things around us every day, and that includes infrastructure. We often don't realize how deep infrastructure runs, literally and figuratively, in our community. And we love to tell that story in events, to classrooms, to people of all ages. And I'm excited to bring Ebony Hood back with us to show us a little bit about how they talk about the urban water cycle in classrooms to, to people of all ages. And it's exciting to take a look and see what tools they use to tell that story and what it looks like. So Ebony, I'm glad to turn this over to you and we'll let you take it from here. Great. So today we have set up uh, two separate models we're gonna talk about that kind of summarizes the urban water cycle. I love using this model, not, not so much as a demonstration, but as a visual to kind of give students the idea and even adults of how water flows in our environment. We talk about where we get our drinking water supply from. So if you would think about Lake Erie as our source of drinking water, it's gonna to go to our water treatment plant where it goes through a series of being clean through filters. And we've all seen the giant water towers where water is stored. And that's how we would get our water it's going to be pumped to our houses, it's going to be pumped to our businesses, our offices, and that's when we, we began to start using it. What's cool about this model is they actually have a little hole on top, so you can actually do visuals to show people how the wastewater is going into the environment. So here's the magic, John. Let me show you this. We do a lift up, boom. You can kind of see on this model what we're not able to see in person and on our streets. So underneath the ground, we know that we have tons of pipes sewer lines, drinking water lines that run underneath that supplies our water. So if we think about our homes, we know that water, drinking water is pumped in to give us the clean water. Once we flush our toilets, do our number ones and our number twos is then wastewater. Same thing from our businesses, our schools, where we go to shop. All of that water will then go down to our wastewater treatment plant. The magic of modeling where we can kind of see all of our large debris is trapped behind bar screens. It will go to, through our treatment process. We know that oil and grease is a problem. We would get that out of the system and begin to treat the water all the way up to where we will finally clean it. We'll, um, if it's our beach season, we'll chlorinate the water and then dechlorinate to make sure it's safe for our environment. And it goes back out into the Cuyahoga River or Lake Erie. The magic of this that I also like to show John Unfortunately, sometimes we have pollutants in our environment. So when we have heavy rains, there's things out there, trash, maybe it's a water bottle or pop can, that can go directly into our storm drains. And again, with the magic, you can see that all of that will travel through our creeks and our streams and still end up back into Lake Erie. So that's what we want to avoid. So now would be a good time to transition and talk about what we would consider point source solution where we actually know where the contaminants are coming from to non-point source solution pollution where we're not really sure what could be on the ground what's there what could be contaminating our waterways so with this model we can kind of see what a typical environment would look like we know that we have our farms where we get our meat our different produce will come from there and if you think about it farmers need what to have our fruits and veggies grow you know we need fertilizers same thing, maybe Mr. Jones down the street has that beautiful yard, you know, he's doing a weed and a feed to make sure it's beautiful. As you can see, we have visuals, kind of the same idea, this trash in our environment that we can visually see that's out there. 
all of these things are problems. Maybe you were out walking your dog. So again, just a visual. You were out walking your dog in the neighborhood. Oh, guess what? He's pooping and you did not clean that up. How gross is that? And we all know that we have that neighbor that has left dog poop everywhere. That's disgusting. But how this thing is kind of magnified is when it begins to rain. Everyone loves the part where you can be in to make it rain. So we have our spray bottle here, and this is the part where you can kind of get a visual as to what's actually happening in our environment when there's non-point source pollution on the ground. The rain kind of magnifies this, and you can kind of see what it's looking like. And all of that runoff, all of that pollution goes into our waterways and makes a giant mess in Lake Erie or into the Cuyahoga River and all of our tributaries. So that's not something that we want to have. So again, you can visually see how important it is to make sure that we do our part to make sure our environment is clean. Who wants to go into Lake Erie when it's looking like that with all of the runoff? So typically, we can't really see runoff unless it's maybe like oil leaking from a car, maybe uh, some type of truck had a spill, you know, oil, petroleum spill, and you can visually see like a huge amount. But most of the time, these are subtle things that are happening in our environment, and they build up over time in order to create this pollution. So a lot of people will ask us after they see the visual, they're like, well, what can, what can we do? How can we help? And I'm like, glad you asked that question. So the simplest thing we can do is basically pick up trash. So there's uh, river sweeps going on in our environment where you can actually go, you can do uh, cleanups at the beach to make sure that trash is picked up out, out of our environment. You do not have to weed and feed your yard. You can let nature just do its thing. If you are in agriculture and you're looking for ways to mitigate things, you can, you can have vegetated strips. So again, this is a model, but you can have vegetated strips that you can put in place that will actually be a natural filter to keep the toxins out of our water supply. There's also constructed wetlands. So if you think about all of our stormwater projects through Project Pink Lake, we're actually capturing like stormwater before it goes out into the environment. A wetland would, would be like a natural feature or a man-made feature that can work in a similar way. So these are all the different ways that we can work together to make sure that we keep our environment clean. You don't wanna have cars with leaking oil. Just make sure you do your part. Make sure you keep what, what would be a good dog's name, Gunner, <laughs> you know, Wufe. make sure you keep your little pet's poop in a baggie and in the trash. That's not something we want to have going into our environment because who wants to swim with poop when you're at Lake Gary Beach? Thank you, Ebony. I'm glad you were able to make that connection. I think that the way that those models help to really represent the work that we do and the impacts that all of us as as residents, as homeowners, as kids, as adults, all of us have the have an ability to impact the environment, both for positive and the negative. And an example like this and the models that we use when we are interacting with, with students is a great way to engage and help them see what happens in the urban water cycle and how we can contribute to its health uh, or its, its illness. And we want to make sure we are making it better and healthier, certainly in the work that we do. I wanna bring Jessica Schutte back into the conversation. She joined Ebony uh, earlier in the week for our day one broadcast to really set the stage for what the urban water cycle is all about. So I'm glad to have Jessica back with us uh, this afternoon for today's broadcast, following up on the, a lot of the outreach that was talked about in, in Ebony's walkthrough. So Jessica, thank you again for joining us again. Hey, John G, glad to be here. And so what I wanted to do is to, is to speak to what I think is so fun with those types of, uh, with those types of, of activities is the hands-on nature. It's, it's, the fact that they almost look like toys that, that help to make a connection, especially with our younger audiences. Uh, why are those types of models and those types of demonstrations so important when it comes to outreach? Well, as everyone's heard throughout this week of Clean Water Fest is our work is complicated. It's kind of hard to understand. So we have to find a way to bring it to an age level that's appropriate for all of our audiences. So for our younger kids, our preschoolers, our elementary kids, we want them to understand our work, get our messaging, but have fun with it too. And who doesn't have fun with poop emojis? So we figured out some really creative ways to, there's one there right there, 
uh, we found out some really creative ways in how to have children and kids understand and keep that love for science, get excited about it and want to keep going with it. You know, as our mad scientist said earlier, you know, we love science. We want kids to continue to love science as well. So anything that we can do on an outreach level is really important for us. As you mentioned, we have we have audiences of all ages, uh, audiences of all of all interests, and we have ways of, of bringing this information to them and relating to them wherever they are. Are there questions that are common amongst all audiences, or do you really have pockets of questions based on the age of the group you're speaking to or the size of the group you're speaking to? What are some things that those questions may be in common, and what are some specific ones you get from a lot of the places you go to talk? Um, we get, you know, all various types of questions. You know, we have our younger folks, uh, our kindergartners, our preschoolers, and they're very curious as to where it goes. You know, so we, a lot of times if we're in the classrooms, you know, we open up underneath the sinks and show them the pipes and then they get that visual. So we try to use as much resources as we can that they understand so they can get that messaging. Um, as we get into the older groups, you know, we try to hone in on more career base so we can allow them to know that we have various careers offered at the sewer district. Um, and then they also get excited about the science part of it, the lab. And, you know, a lot of people are really surprised to see how many jobs we offer at the sewer district and, you know, the vast amount of uh, work that we do, not just in one area, but multiple areas throughout Northeast Ohio. And the more conversations we can have with students about the work we do and the more interested and enthusiastic we can, we can uh, help them to be, it helps them to have conversations with their, with their parents, with their friends. And if we can make it funny, it's even more uh, possible that they will share that and tell that story once again. Uh, the audiences that also we want to make sure are, are uh, clearly identified are the, our seniors or those who are, are looking for ways in which we can help them in, in tough times. And we even have conversations with, uh, with, with customers who are looking for assistance and, and the better understanding that they can have about the work that we do uh, opens those doors for them to understand that we also offer means to help them in tough times. And we're, we're in one of those tough times now for many, uh, for many individuals and families in this COVID era, and it certainly affected how we reach out. Clean Water Fest this year is, is online because we recognize that there's a new way that we have to be able to, to reach our customers. Uh, Jessica, can you speak to how COVID has affected our outreach efforts, how we've adapted, and kind of what that looks like in the current work that you're doing? So our uh, outreach is literally what we're doing right now. You know, we're virtual. And so we can still take a lot of the things that we do in the classrooms um, or, if, you know, Girl Scout, Boy Scout troops um, out in the communities, at festivals, we could take a lot of that stuff that we do there and bring it right to as we are doing this week. So Clean Water Fest is a great resource for teachers, um, outside community members, anyone to just really not only understand the work that we do, but get some creative fun ideas to do things at home, our science experiments, their math scientists, that kind of thing. So we've seen that, yeah, we had to kind of change around our outreach because we can't be in your face having fun, but we can still have fun virtually with you today. And so what, what we have learned over the last several months of this, uh, of our current state of affairs, what have we learned about what the future of our outreach might look like? We recognize that we have an obligation to share information with our customers and part of our service to them is education. So what does education look like uh, if, from your perspective in terms of what direction we may be going here uh, beyond COVID when, when things are, are back to some sense of normality? Well, we still have, you know, we've always had our speakers bureau that folks can ask for information um, we have our tour requests that folks can request a tour. And luckily, since we've done our, um, all of these virtual videos and stuff, folks can still go to our website, nursd.org, and have a Speakers Bureau request. That means Ebony and I coming to you virtually in your classrooms or sending links of information. If you want a tour, obviously we can't be hands-on touring right now, but we can do it virtually for you. So we have a lot of resources that will be available um, on our website for folks to go to see because, you know, COVID may go away, but, you know, folks may not feel comfortable coming out and about. So luckily we have uh, quite a vast amount of resources virtually to give people that information so they have it, and that they still feel comfortable um, with everything with the social distancing. Yeah, and I think what, what I like to focus on, uh, and certainly our Speakers Bureau is a way of doing that, is focusing on the resource that we have that in, in great abundance, and it's, it's passionate employees who, who know their work. Uh, who are, are respected in, in the region in terms of our ability to serve and share information. So if you're looking for someone to, uh, to speak to your class, to speak to your community group, to speak to you, uh, we are more than happy to, to share those resources. So as Jessica mentioned, if you're interested in, in looking into what resources we can offer you uh, now or in the future, first of all, you can check us out at neorsd.org request. 
You can request a plant tour, which would be virtual in this circumstance, or you can request one of our speakers to, uh, to speak to your class and perhaps offer a presentation similar to what you have seen from Ebony or from Jessica. So outside of that, option number two is this cleanwaterfest.com resource. If you haven't checked it out, every day's activities uh, feature the videos that we showcase on that day's broadcast, as well as some supplementary resources. So if you go to the day four broadcast for today uh, on cleanwaterfest.com, you'll see uh, several different ingredients to, to have some of these recipes for your own at-home experiments. You'll find downloads that you can print out and share with classes or with your family and being able to have this conversation in a fun way. Uh, I, I can also say you may find a funny video of Jessica uh, taking a poop quiz uh, from several years back. I don't know if she realizes that I still have that feature there but it's one of our more popular clips, Jessica, so I'm not gonna get rid of that very easily. So you can see Jessica take the poop <laughs> quiz and, and know what our work is, uh, is all about. Jessica, I wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon and recognize that we still have day five ready to go for you tomorrow. Day five is our last live broadcast, but if you're watching this archived, uh, day five will be archived as well. And so we look forward to that uh, conversation. Tomorrow is a, what we're calling a field day Friday. And we're gonna do a lot of streaming and streaming is not just the live stream, but actual in the environment stream. We're looking forward to, to uh, getting a little bit of a closer look at the work that we do in streams and what that looks like in your backyard, in your neighborhood, and being able to better connect and continue to engage you on the topics that matter, certainly for Clean Water Fest and for, for topics beyond. Uh, Jessica, thank you. Thank you to all of our yeah. team who's been with us today. Uh, thank you to Adam and to Pete for joining us as well. We hope you'll check out our archive broadcast and all of the features that you've seen this week on cleanwaterfest.com. I'm John G. at NEORSD. So for the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, thank you for joining us, and we will talk to you again tomorrow.